so thanks for coming. Um, I'm Georg. I'm happen to to work on Tor Browser, um, and uh, as Fredrik said on the deterministic builds. <clears throat> so um, we just heard uh, from Philip uh, what kind of game this is detecting b um, bad uh, relays. And wouldn't it be smart if you had kind of a um, tool for the user to uh, be protected, um, be more protected? And it turns out we have one. It is called a Tor browser. Um, you might no, it was backwards. You might you might ask yourself, why do we need a whole new browser for this kind of detection or protection? Um, well. It turns out we had first a uh, Firefox extension called Tor Button, which basically is, um, as the name says, um, a button in your Firefox browser and you can toggle on and toggle off your, your Tor usage. And this turns out to be a really <coughs> bad idea for a couple of reasons. The one reason is it doesn't fit to the mental model the user have um, for how the browser is working. Um, Imagine you have uh, several couple of tabs open, in your, tabs open in your browser and it turns out one of these particular tabs has a website in it and this website is blocking Tor. But you really want to visit this website today or now. And what you're doing with the uh, toggle model Tor button had was you just switched off Tor. You visited the website, but then you just forgot to enable it again. So uh, you sh uh, shot your yourself in the foot. And the other issue is um, why, the, why the Firefox API is quite, um, quite powerful. It is still not powerful enough for our purposes because there were still um, privacy issues with um, certain Firefox features which were not patchable from Tobotten itself. So Mike Perry um, set out to um, take the huge task on his shoulders and maintained a Firefox fork for quite a while, almost alone, and um, which basically is now a Tor browser. It is based on Firefox because Firefox is a free and uh, an open browser, and we have the capability to uh, audit it and uh, audit its features and write patches and can distribute it. You might think, why not using Chromium or Chrome? Because you might have heard that they may, they may have a better track rec record regarding security features. Well, the latter may be true, may, might be true, but the Chromium people are not really willingly to uh, fix some nasty leaks they have in their browser regarding privacy and um, proxy behavior. For instance, um, they have um, a proxy bypass. You can they're using the crypto API on Windows, and it happens that this usage of the crypto API in Windows is bypassing your proxy uh, settings in your browser, and there's nothing we can do about this. And uh, they even are not willing to fix this issue. It's not important enough to them. So we, we stick to Firefox. So another thing is if you really want to use uh, the Tor network safely, how, how can you be sure that you really get the Tor browser we produced? Well, the first point is it's downloaded over HTTPS. This is almost a no-brainer, of course. And if you have a reasoned enough browser, you get even certificate pinning of our websites, which is nice. But then we have additionally um, signed these bundles with a Tor Browser Developer Signing Key to give you the opportunity to verify these bundles on your own machine. Um, but you might uh, think about um, the updating things. What what am, am I doing if I need to update my browser? And this happens actually um, every <coughs> six weeks now because Firefox switched to a rapid uh, release schedule as well. So the old school way would be downloading uh, every six weeks a whole browser and verifying it again and uh, importing your bookmarks again and doing all the customizations. So what we did is we uh, patched the uh, Firefox updater to work with our system. And you are getting now updates every six weeks 
automatically. And this, um, these updates are currently only safeguarded by HTTPS basically, and we have a kind of certificate authority pinning in the browser. But um, this is going to change in two weeks when the newest state release is coming. So, but even then, what gives you, maybe you're more adventurous in saying, well, I don't, I don't care about these uh, HTTPS things. I just download the source, verify the text, and build all the things myself on my laptop, my computer. Well, you could do this, but you probably won't do this because it's quite tricky and it's quite complex, and you have actually the, uh, uh, the bundles just one download away. So, but <coughs> if you think further, what gives you the certainty that there is a direct link between the source code and the binaries you get, right? What, what, what happens if uh, our building machine is compromised? What, is, uh, what happens if one of the developers who holds the signing keys um, thinks, well, let's put a malware in it and sign it anyway? So Mike Perry again sat down and took the task to establish deterministic builds for Tor browser, for all platforms. Deterministic builds, I'm not talking about this much because it's actually an old talk because it's such a huge topic. But the Bitcoin people developed uh, deterministic builds, which give you bit by bit identical uh, outcomes of a certain uh, source you put in, which is um, may, maybe obvious to some, but maybe not obvious, I don't know. Anyway, it is a property which is really nice to have because then you can have dozens of different people building on different machines and they all agree on um, a certain Tor browser at the end because they all have bit by bit identical builds. And you can be pretty uh, sure that um, you don't have one compromised machine, build machine it's, it's pretty hard to compromise all of those machines if you have a bunch of builders. So, what are the key features of Tor Browser? It is basically a self-contained portable app. You download it, you put it on your computer, and you extract it, and you start it, and you can use it, and then if you don't want it anymore, you just put the folder in your trash, and then all of it is gone. There are no disk uh, activity records by default, meaning if you have it on your USB device or a USB stick and you put it on a computer of a friend and you start it, then it won't happen that your personal data or things are on your computer of your friend. It's still only on your device. Then two things we have, which I'm going to talk a bit more in detail later on, is third-party tracking prevention and browser fingerprinting defenses. And we have um, censorship circumvention. There are people like in countries like uh, Iran or, or China which cannot reach the Tor network because the governments there have firewalls and other censorship equipment which prevents this. So we have um, developed so-called pluggable transports which obfuscates traffic in order to make it much, much, much trickier for, the, for those governments to detect tour traffic and block tour traffic. These um, pluggable transports, uh, Philip wrote one actually, um, are part of Tor browser. So can, if you happen to be in such a country and your traffic gets blocked, <coughs> then you can switch easily to one of those transports and um, you can surf on the Tor network, over the Tor network. And we have some browser security enhancements Mainly things like um, hardening our binaries against buffer overflows um, and things. So the components are, as I said, a Firefox. We don't have um, the normal Firefox. We have the Enterprise Edition, which um, switches actually every 10 months. And in between, they only have security updates. It's much more conservative code base to, uh, to evaluate than following all the time the rapid release Firefox has adopted. Of course we ship Tor, then we ship Tor Launcher, and as the name already says, 
that's the part of the Tor browser that is launching Tor and is controlling Tor and talking to Tor. Then we have the already mentioned Tor button, which gives you some control over your privacy settings. It tells you that everything is okay with your browser and um, checks for updates and things. Then we have an interesting tool called HTTPS Everywhere. This is uh, one of the things this makes uh, your Tor browser much more, um, much better to, to to use than a normal Firefox if you have the sped exit relays in mind. What this tool is doing is it is transforming HTTP HTTP requests into HTTPS requests um, if it has a rule inside a database which is shipped with it for rewriting these kind of um, domains. That means you go to um, http colon slash slash a dot com and uh, HTTPS everywhere is looking into its database and, and see, huh, I have a rule for um, reaching a secure website. Um, or, or is, is this domain securely? And is applying this rule and before the uh, request is um, going over the wire, it is rewriting this to HTTPS colon slash slash a dot com and just uh, requesting uh, the secure version directly. Then we have NoScript. NoScript is usually used by us for easy, for easy use of, um, or for easy possibility of disabling scripts or uh, handling your, your media content. And then we have the so-called pluggable, pluggable transports. So, um, I don't plan to um, to explain all those tracking defenses and fingerprinting defenses in detail. What I want to convey to you is uh, our proto philosophy and giving you a hint how we are doing this and how we are implementing <coughs> this. Because uh, this pro browser is actually kind of a prototype, and this um, one one intention is to to urge other browser um, developers to apply this philosophy we have in mind in order to give not only Tor users a uh, private browsing experience which deserves it, its name but all those other users as well. So what we want to do, um, we want to pr preserve the existing user model. This is one really important point to make here because um, Tor button is, um, as I said earlier, is one of its, uh, of, of its obvious um, failures of this preserving of this uh, existing user model. What I have in mind here is um, users usually have a mental model uh, of how browsers are supposed to work. You know, they, have, they, they want to have multiple tabs. They want to uh, know, if I click this button, this is happening. They want to have bookmarks and all those things. And if you develop a browser um, that is basically against these, this kind of mental model, then users are going away. And if users are going away, you have only a small user group, right? Like a couple of, uh, couple of users, a dozen of users. But this makes it much more easier for attackers to single you out. So you need a, a, a large user base in order to uh, be able to hide uh, among them. Then, uh, additionally, we, we want to have an imp implementation of a uh, privacy enhancing technique in a way that it's not likely to break websites. Because, I mean, if it's easy to lock a browser down in a way that it's almost secure and almost um, no privacy, uh, and almost no privacy invasion can happen. But if you have such a locked down browser, what is happening is, again, you have just six or seven or eight or nine or ten or users which are able to um, still use the web because all the other people want to have your Facebook or want to have um, Twitter or whatever and this is going to break definitely in this uh, locked down browser. So what we want to have is um, implementations that um, while uh, guarding your privacy um, give you still the usability of your normal browser experience then important point is plugins must be restricted. Plugins are actually really evil. Um, 
because plugins can easily bypass as well the proxy settings in your browser. So we made it. Uh, we made a patch for the Tor browser that it, um, restricted plugins in the way that you even you are even not allowed to uh, load plugins into your yeah, process address space. Um, one exception is Flash because Flash is still widely used. While we don't ship it, we uh, mm, we give the user the opportunity to still enable it. But you must you must jump through uh, several hoops in order to do so. Then another uh, lesson of the Tor button area was that we need to minimize the global privacy options. Because if you have dozens of options, it's very likely that you are clicking on some things, forgetting things about it, and then you have a unique kind of set of options checked, and it's pretty easy to single you out while you're serving the web. Um, an important point to me is the, ne uh, the next one. We have a no filters policy. You might have heard some some people or companies claiming that in order to um, have, have a private um, experience on the web, you have to use some filter software like ad bloggers, right? Like ad block, ad block plus. Or Mozilla recently launched the Polaris um, thing and they have, they, they think they want to have kinds of um, blocking lists as well, which is filtering out the advertisements. Because they think if we get, got rid of the ads, then we are fine with pri regarding privacy in the web. So there are a couple of points to make here. The first thing is who decides which sites are coming on those lists? Who is controlling those people who, say, who are saying these ads are bad to us? Um, so we don't want to get in this business. We want to say um, we want to have a private uh, privacy by design. Um, solution which uh, doesn't uh, take care of these ads thing in particular because I mean even if those ads are gone imagine an internet where you don't have ads the underlying um, tracking opportunities are still there so that means you, you can get rid of all those ads that's fine but still you're getting tracked by people who are don't, don't want to sell you things but using the, um, the same underlying uh, mechanism so that's why we are thinking it's wrong to uh, to jump on this no filter strain. And apart from the, um, the fact, maybe there are really some small companies or medium-sized companies or whatever which are really have a le legitimate business model based on ads on certain kinds of ads. You will destroy these uh, these business models for for no good. And the last one is um, stay up to date. It just um, doesn't mean um, that you have to update all the time. Yeah, that's, that's a given. But updating, um, stay up to date means as well that you keep um, an eye out for upcoming problems in order to, uh, to be able to react uh, uh, swiftly. Um, and then this gives you more time to audit new technologies, new features, and develop defenses. Okay, tracking protection. So what we are con concerned with is um, tracking across different domains. That means you're visiting in one tab, um, let's say, site foo.com, and on the, on the second tab, site bar.com. <coughs> and what we want uh, to achieve is that people who have embedded things on both sites are not able to correlate the traffic um, of you. So and the technical terms are that you want to have bound um, all those identifiers to the URL bar domain. This is our solution. The easy one would be we just disable all those third-party tracking techniques like third-party cookies or um, third-party cache state um, things or dump stores, third-party dump stores things or stuff. Uh, but as I said earlier, that would be uh, really devastating to some of the functionality we have currently in the web, which loses, uh, which gives you basically users who are unhappy and are leaving you. So our solution is we um, separate state by saying all the things that are saved while you are 
saved in your computer, like cookies or cache state or dump storage or HTTP authentication credentials. All those things that are saved on your computer while you're visiting um, uh, foo.com should not be awa <coughs> available to bar.com, uh, which is a different domain. So they are bound, all those identi identifiers are bound to the OL bar domain. And if this is not possible, because if you look at these uh, at this slide here, we have, we have some curly braces here, and these curly braces uh, indicate things uh, which we don't have tackled yet, like third-party cookies. There is a, a patch we have, but it's not um, ready for prime time yet. So if um, we have things which uh, we haven't fixed, then we try to disable this feature, like third-party cookies, or um, flash cookies in this case. How should this look like at the end? The goal is to have such a kind of privacy user interface, where you only have um, the top level um, domains you have visited, and then all those um, data um, that is stored on your computer <coughs> is uh, behind this icon, basically. And then you can use it normally, like remove this data or collect uh, site tracking data, but it's, it's, it's site based. And this uh, has uh, the advantage that it's basically leaving the functionality. The site is totally uh, still working. Um, if you have, for instance, captures, which is using some kind of third-party provider like Recapture, this is still working. Um, but across domains, you're not trackable anymore. So fingerprinting is a different beast. Fingerprinting basically means um, that people are checking if you are if you are visiting a site with a certain device, like a certain laptop, because um, is it uh, it is c capturing screen sizes and uh, your user agent of your browser, your headers you send, even your time zone. So it's it's easy for JavaScript, for instance, to extract your time zone um, and. <clears throat> Um, our idea is to say we want to have users as uniform as possible in this regard. This means um, we try to return the same values for everybody. Like the user agent is a good example. Um, your Firefox or whatever browser you're using is, is telling the server, hi, I'm, for instance, a Firefox, I'm on version 31, and I'm on a Windows system, and um, then the server is saying, hmm, that's good, and it's, it's maybe acting on it and sending appropriate, appropriate data back. But um, what we are doing is we give um, every user the same user agent, regardless if she is using a uh, Linux box or a OS X box or a Windows box. The same happens with HTTP headers. The same happens actually with the time zone. So we are setting the time zone to UTC. <coughs> Everybody uh, who is using Tor browser is on UTC. And again, the curly brace, braces, we are trying to do the same with fonts because fonts is, uh, are, is a really nasty, uh, uh, fingerprinting via fonts is a really nasty technique because the system fonts that you have on your computer are highly identi uh, identifying. Um, so what we are thinking is shipping the Tor browser with a pre-configured set of fonts, which everybody gets and um, which eliminates this kind of fingerprinting vector. So if this is not working, then what are you going to do? We try to, first we try to put users in different buckets, you can say, like in different groups. Um, this happens, for instance, for the screen and window sizes. So if you're starting Tor browser, we are rounding your window sizes to a multiple of 200 and 100. This gives a bunch of different um, buckets, uh, which hopefully has a lot of users in each of these buckets in order to make it much harder to single uh, users out based on their screen sizes. Um, if this idea is not working as well, then we are disabling things. There's a bunch of things I wrote here and a bunch of things which is missing, uh, which is missing we, we, dis we disable. Like plugins, as I said, and the Gamepad API is a funny thing. There's an API which um, allows the browser to enumerate your USB devices you have on your, uh, on your computer attached. Then there's a possibility um, that you <coughs> uh, 
um, that the browser uh, that a server is fingerprinting your uh, your open your open ports on your on your network and, and, and things like this. So still, we have um, talked about um, cross um, cross domain tracking and fingerprinting. There's still a thing which is really worrisome because there are powerful trackers out there which you are uh, actually acting on a day by day basis directly. So not cross domain, um, which is handled by those things I talked earlier about. But um, you're talking directly to, to your favorite search engine. That means um, it gets uh, the opportunity to save cookies on your computer and uh, save other cache cookies and other state on your computer. And basically, if you uh, never um, take care of this data, um, it, it gives the search engine, for instance, a high opportunity to profile your traffic and uh, reveal some patterns you might not ever know yourself about. So what we want to do uh, to tackle this issue is we want to take care of this long-term unlinkability by, via a button called the new identity button in this case. And what this new identity button in the Tor browser is doing, it clears all linkable identifiers and browser state easily. So it, it gives you a clean blank slate again. And it gives you even a, notor a new Tor circuit, meaning that you are having a, uh, with high probability, a new exit node. Uh, and uh, so that even Google can't correlate things anymore based on IP address or other things. So, the future is bright. Um, the next stable release is coming actually um, in two weeks. And um, we, we implemented a feature in this one that Tor circuits are bound to the UL border domain now as well. That means if you are going to a.com, um, then you're going via a certain circuit. But if you're going to b.com in a different tab, for instance, then you're taking a different path through the Tor network. That makes it much, much harder for exit relays to correlate your traffic. And before this, um, the problem is that all your browser traffic is usually going to one, uh, through one of the exit relays uh, in a time frame of 10 minutes. So what we are doing is we are switching um, the exit relay every 10 minutes in order to minimize or make it less risky that the exit relay is correlating all your browser traffic. And what we are going um, from the next release on is um, binding these domains to the uh, binding Tor circuits to domains as well to make this correlation much harder. Then we have <clears throat> another feature is uh, this security slider, so-called security slider, which gives you the opportunity to um, handle your different um, security. Uh, um, yeah, how should, I, how should I name it? Um, security purposes you have or security feelings you have in a sane way. You have a slider. This is basically the, uh, the bucket um, idea we ha we, I had mentioned earlier, where you have four positions actually, which is setting certain kinds of preferences in the same way. Um, and you can hope that you have a lot of followers uh, in your bucket. And you can, for instance, in the high security setting, uh, this a the high security setting is this ABN JavaScript and uh, making all those uh, media things click to play and um, giving you other benefits as well. Then uh, we have uh, eventually the Tor browser updates signed by a key as well. So you're not only relying on HTTPS anymore, but uh, the bundles are signed as well, and they are later on. Um, even checked uh, via the Tor consensus too. And we are planning actually so-called hardened bundles um, for the end of the year, which, is, which has some um, interesting features. Uh, they are built with uh, address sanitizer on and some memory hardening techniques. And 
they are supporting Unix domain sockets in a way that lets you, at least on Linux and on OS X, disable the whole network stack and just communicate with your Tor instance via these Unix domain sockets, which makes it much, much harder to leak um, accidentally um, network requests. So we have some conclusions prepared. They're basically almost obvious, I think. So you should use Tor browser by default. This is um, the most same thing, actually, what you can do at the moment if you want to s surf over the Tor network. Um, the problem of bad exit is not negligible, but it's, as Philip said, all also blown out of proportion. If you look at um, how many exit relays we have, how much effort we take um, detecting them quickly and disabling them quickly and how much protection the Tor browser is giving you. And as you have seen, uh, at least in my talk, um, about all those curly braces showing up here and there and all those uh, ellipses I, I made uh, for leaving things out, there's help needed in many areas because it's um, a huge topic and it's important for users. So, thanks for coming. We have some stickers here, and um, I think we are now up for some Q&A things. <laughs>